Wow. Okay. I'm here with Kevin Bethune. Kevin, how are you today? I'm doing fine, John. Thanks for having me. Ah, thanks for being here. You know, we were talking about CX for a while and, you know, I knew nothing about the consultancy world and you're like, <laughs> you should definitely figure it out, John. So thanks for that <laughs> suggestion. Happy to help. Um, so for all of you here, I had this incredible video thing set up last night and it just didn't work out, but Kevin's a designer like me, so we adapt and try to figure out how to make it work. So if this isn't the perfect production level quality thing, I apologize in advance, it's my fault. So just a brief introduction here on Kevin Bethune. Kevin's background spans engineering, business and design in equal proportion over 20 plus years, positioning him to help brands deliver meaningful innovations to enrich people's lives. Check this out. After his MBA, Kevin joined Nike in a business capacity, not as a designer. Uh, and he navigated the global footwear product engine. And then along the way, he discovered Albert Shum, Microsoft. Love Albert. Um, <laughs> and he went to Art Center College to study industrial design. And then after that, he kept going. He, he, was, uh, he was at Booz and Allen, BCG. He was VP of Strategic Design at BCG Digital Ventures. And been a huge fan of Kevin. We had dinner in Silicon Valley years ago when Kevin was thinking like, maybe, maybe I need a, a turn in my <laughs> life. And, and you were so bold and went ahead and did that. So well, thanks first, for the inspiration. <laughs> first of all, Kevin, um, again, this is my LinkedIn Live. It's kind of like, like my YouTube. But any thoughts you want to share before we enter the CX report while I kind of prepare the AV over here? No. Um, I think uh, for, for a lot of us, um, the world has changed on a dime, it seems. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, folks waking up. And I think the optimist in me is, is hopeful that we see some change across the board. I think uh, um, the disparities, uh, the, the situation with COVID, I think exacerbating and shining a light on many issues. And then I think the unfortunate tragedies that we've witnessed over the last few weeks has definitely uh, woken us all up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the business of design. This is your, like one of your many areas of expertise. <laughs> and I thought we'd go through some of the slides you selected from the CX report. And mm -hmm. because this is live, it always makes it harder to do things, but it's also more interesting in a way. Um, as you know, I had this thing set up with the AV to work through HDMI through multiple computers here. I kind of want to see if it works. So uh, for, uh, we'll try it and then we'll like pivot because that's how we learn. Let's see, sure, digital, see, chart, audio, FaceTime, whatever, like, like, okay. All right, okay. So let, let, let me just try it here. Okay. Oh. Perfect. Okay, all right. Okay, here we go. All right, I had my fancy graphics. Okay, we can still see each other on screen. Good. We and can. Then, okay, okay, good. So I think, can you say something? Testing, one, Ooh, two, three. Good. So I have a little meter that tells me, because otherwise it'll loop around in a, in a bad way. Okay, now if this works well, I have audio to play from the keynote. If it doesn't play, you won't, You, me and Kevin won't know, so, uh, my special person will tell me in, in, in 15 seconds after if it's not playing, but it has like uh, subtitles and stuff so you can, you can hear what is not being set. Okay, mm. so first off, wanted to dig into, oh, not that, it's over here. Want to dig into uh, David Bowie. And I don't know if it's you, Kevin, but I wasn't really a David Bowie fan for that fan period. I just noticed that when he passed away, there was all these things to learn about him. And mm -hmm. there was this video going around where he was interviewed in 1999 on the BBC. So let's see if this works. Interesting. The video is not working. Huh. There's some kind of like catastrophic quick time error, but let me sort of voice over what happened. So basically he's being interviewed by the BBC and he's being said, told the internet, big deal. And he says, no, the internet's actually a huge deal because it's like an alien life form has landed on earth. Hmm. And it's because he understood technology and media. And then 
And it's interesting that play doesn't work in this mode. So then, then this morning, this morning I remembered this video that I found in 1983, uh, David Bowie being interviewed by the MTV. But then he flipped the, the roles around where he began to interview the, <laughs> the MTV person. <laughs> and he basically said, hey, I noticed that you don't play any music videos with black people. And I can tell you the hours that you do and the hours that you don't. And so he was very datafully minded. And oh. he really got MTV to ask the question of like, like, who are we doing this for? Because his response is, we're doing it for all of America. But what does that mean? Um, so he pointed out exclusion very, very starkly. And that's a subtext for, because we don't know it doesn't work, but I'll put that online. So, Kevin, you were interested in this slide, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Can you share, share why? Sure, and I'm not sure if it, if it animates in, but uh, thank you. So, as we think about the four industrial revolutions, um, I, it made me curious about, like, what if you were to overlay the rise of the financial engines that made these, these um, industrial revolutions possible? What were the economic engines? And who was able to actually build wealth through those motions? Um, who was also exploited and who was left out? Th those, those are the questions that naturally came to mind when I saw this in your presentation. Because, you know, there were a certain few people who were able to have access to computers, first of all, um, mm -hmm. as kids. It's all these kids, the hackers, whatever, and they were lucky to have computers, but you kind of had to have enough money to have a computer. Mm -hmm. You also That's had to right. go to a nice school with computers. And... Um, I know that personally because I was bused across Seattle. I lived in the part of town that was primarily African American and Samoan American. And if I didn't get bused across town to the nice school, I would never have seen a computer. So I know a little bit of what that means. And this one is something that caught Indeed. your attention. Yeah, during your presentation, I, I liked how you animated uh, sort of these two engines how, and how they sort of coalesce with each other, the infinite loop, as you put it. Uh, but that buyer experience, uh, especially with <laughs> computation sort of fueling it, it's spinning so fast. And um, when we think about people and the customer experience, it just made me think of um, customer experience definitely isn't uh, a linear sort of progression. Uh, it is cyclical as you as you have it, but it also wobbles. There's also all kinds of nonlinearities, loopbacks. And it made me wonder, you know, is that, is that spinning buyer experience sort of approaches the customer experience? does it have potential to, to actually induce harm, almost like a saw and cut into you know, our lives, whether it's uh, overstepping the bounds, uh, breaching trust, um, and maybe not even timing the experience in, in a way that actually provides the right type of utility when needed. And in a world of big data, um, is the information that we're consuming and need to consume at that moment actually relevant? And then lastly, um, are we striking an emotional chord here? Are you, are you hitting me at an inflection point in my life where there's a clear on-ramp and off-ramp to actually help me and, and, and make my life more meaningful? As a technologist, you know, you're, you're a trained engineer, you understand invisible phenomenon. And having worked with so many pure business people, why, why is it hard for the pure business person, non-technologist, to not understand this phenomenon? Um, I, I think, I think the, the level of, of scale that we're talking about, uh, and, and the, um, would you call it the recursion, the infinite loops, the scale of like dealing with millions of people, billions of people. And, and as you put it, computers never get tired, uh, and, and it's software, right? Um, the, these things, uh, operate outside the bounds of conventional business speak, conventional business language conventional business frameworks. And I think, um, you know, no surprise, we've seen so much disruption over the last 10 to 20 years um, where, you know, software has taken over many things. Uh, software can make the, the landscape under, uh, underneath your feet actually shift on a dime and, and the value criteria of where your customers are has consistently changed and your business has no time to really adjust. It's almost like an ocean freighter trying to steer around uh, uh, an iceberg or something. When you think about your role at consultancy and different levels of companies, and you're talking to the lead stakeholder 
who's looking at you like, what? I don't see anything <laughs> happening that fast. You know, mm -hmm. what would you say to them now? Um, <laughs> I, I would probably say, you know, the, the decks of consumer insights and research reports that you have on your customer, like how, how is that even contextualized? Is it contextualized based on the structure of your current business? Or is it actually tracking and in tune with where your customers are and how they're thinking and what their attitudes, beliefs, and motivations are? And you know, human human beings are idiosyncratic creatures just by nature. Uh, some value criteria, it's the, the deeply held values that we have, some of those value criteria um, hold steady over the you know the dawn of time, mm -hmm. but others actually shift, mm -hmm. you know, in, in months maybe. But I think over the last uh, handful of weeks and days, I mean, the change that we would have anticipated happening over many years has mm. happened in a matter of weeks and days. Mm. You know, when I think of Annie Jean Baptiste, our friend at Product Inclusion in Google, you know, when she yep. talks about how um, she gave me this book upon, uh, about being, becoming proximate. Mm. And it was a new word to me about being proximate to what you may not be accustomed to. Because if you're mm -hmm. not proximate, you don't know what you're talking about. And I find that, you know, the higher up you get, the less proximate you are to anybody. That's right. There's a lot, the higher up you go, the bigger your organization gets, there's a lot of stuff that gets in the way. And um, in my experience dealing with organizations, big and small, especially over the last the last half of my career in, in professional services capacities. Um, tons and tons of research available on these companies, but the, the, the ingredients that were actually missing the most was the deeper insights. Um, and I think, uh, as Andy puts it, it's that proximity, that, that, that co-creation, that, that looking at people not behind sort of the mirrored glass, but really engaging them as equals and as thought partners to create better solutions and better futures. Yeah, it's that thing where like, you know, I think that I know so much more than anyone else and therefore I know exactly how you're feeling and I'm going to make the perfect thing for you. Um, right. I mean, <laughs> exactly. It's laughably sad, but you can remember, like, I can remember when I thought like that. I was like, oh, of course I know everything, blah, blah, blah. And like, no, I don't know that. I don't know that. But um, it's important to get out there. Okay, that third one here. Okay. Third one. Okay. So Kardashev, we really bonded mm. on Kardashev. Can you tell me why <laughs> you're, clearly, you, you're a nerd like me? So um, tell me about Kardashev for you. Uh, definitely um, these, these five types as you articulated. Um, it was really intriguing because if I'm, if I'm honest with myself, um, you know, you, 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 the hope is that most people are at Kardashev three uh, where we're sort of treading water with digital and, and everything. Um, and in my work with large enterprises, I, I definitely find, I find I'm in K3. Uh, when I'm working with startups that are dealing with, you know, heavy tech platforms running behind the scenes, it's definitely K4. So I kind of bounce between K3 and K4 in, in the work that I do presently, always with an eye toward um, K5 in terms of like, where are we, where are we going? Where is this recursion, these infinite loops, the scale taking us and these like multi-universes connecting together. Um, I, I almost like wonder and worry about the tipping point of, you know, are we going to allow um, and, and really steer, you know, our, our, our artificial intelligence and our, you know, quantum computing and all these, all these platforms that we're creating that, that could, you know, cue toward uh, the quote unquote singularity sort of moment or whatever. Um, but I, I wonder about, are we going to see, are we going to see the celebration of the humanities, of, of really celebrating the expertise of understanding how do you get proximate with our, with the people that we're serving, understanding the needs and being able to respond mm -hmm. and have the, com the computation respond with us in an augmented way? Or are we going to continue to see, uh, even, even at a more exponential clip, the disparity that has been plaguing us so badly? Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, when you when you describe it that way. By the way, I have I I I figured this this actually this works, which I love. So when you think because <laughs> nice. we're like gear we, we gear nerd out. So when you think about it, Kardashev one is like early stage. Kardashev two is like more tech. Kardashev three is like I think I kind of made it. 
Carter Chef 4 is big tech. But Carter Chef 5, anyone in Carter Chef 4 is afraid because mm. they know automation. They know this loop like the Terminator. Once you tell it to do one thing, it's just not going to stop. And it can automate inequality. Mm -hmm. And that's a scary, scary thing. We talk about systemic inequality. This can actually make it the system. Yep. Um, before we go leave Carter Chef world, because I, I actually am happy. I was so happy when you noticed the Carter Chef world. <laughs> You're like, what is this thing? You know, like I can't use this. But it's a way to kind of get to the fact that Carter Chef one means you're actually closer to real people. Mm. And Carter Chef four means you're getting really far away from all the people. And I think I, what personally concerns me is some of the big tech companies saying, let's do work from home. That means they're going to be hermetically sealed from so many more kinds of people. The bubble within the bubble. Right. And mm -hmm. then if they're automating everything and we head towards Carter Chef 5, full automation, yeah, so, something to think about. That's something to think about. Oh, uh, yeah. Whew. So you, you enjoyed this one. I, I loved it. <laughs> Tell me about <laughs> this. This I found on the wall of the CEO of Uniqlo, and I probably shouldn't have taken a picture <laughs> of, of the, uh, it was calligraphy. And I was like, oh, my gosh, so beautiful. <laughs> And later on, uh, someone uh, was able to read it for me. But tell me how this resonated with you. No, um, definitely. Um, there's there's a close personal story here. My um, so growing up, my my father uh, spent his entire career in in retail and, and merchandising expertise. Like that was that was his area. Mm -hmm. um, and I had the opportunity several times to just watch him and how he engaged his. Uh, his people, the employees that he was able to serve as their leader and, and many different type of retail formats. Um, and I think there's a, there's a notion of servant leadership that I think was embodied in my father um, that I, I saw how, you know, the employees leaned in to his vision, but he also empowered them to do what they needed to do to be successful. And he, allow, he allowed them to shine in so many ways. So um, when we, when I get to the third statement around, parish store managers, I, I sort of have a flip in my head around now more than ever, leadership needs to really adopt that servant leadership mindset. And that, you know, if you're in a position of power and privilege, if you're a CXO of, of whatever, uh, CMO, CEO, whatever, um, it, it's not to say that you didn't work hard to get to where you are, but I think there is uh, a, a thread of privilege that we need to understand, like whether, whether it's privilege, inheritance, access, that all that basically allowed you to have sort of a level up on the rest of, of the world population to be able to do the things that you do. So more than ever, I think we need to flip the mindset of I'm proud of myself. I'm going to pat myself on the back and live and walk in my power and, and privilege to how can I serve? I, I'm privileged to actually be in this position. How can I serve? And ensure the organization is successful in, in, in serving their you know customers, stakeholders, whatever it might be. Wow. That's a tear up moment. Thank you. That's that's <laughs> seriously, that's really beautiful. Your dad and the example that he set lives in you. Oh, it's powerful. Just want to pause and I'm privileged everyone. that he <laughs> Go ahead. I'm very privileged that he's helping me with uh, with with my dreams design and life organization too. So oh, wow. it's great. Thank you, dad. Wow. Cool dad. <laughs> oh, wow. I want to pause. That's a, that's a key moment. That's like a beautiful moment. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Um, oh, it's so nice. It's, it, it's when you, when you, when you grow up with people who serve other people, you just, that becomes who you are. And if you hang out with people who don't know how to do that, it gets, it can get quite crushing, um, but I'm glad that we all have different examples in our lives sometimes of people who did that around us, and it's a signal to tune into in the universe because it's quite beautiful and rare. Um, whoa, thank you for that. <laughs> and so I was thinking here, like, I was like, uh, it was sort of funny because like, I love this uh, career playbook uh, by Jim Citrin. Um, and um, it has this beautiful curve of like a career arc. And the career arc is you join something, you've got two to three years, and you're like, maybe you like 
made it. You did it. And then suddenly you're kind of <laughs> like, oh, maybe I'm all done. And oh, encore. Ah, no, maybe I'm all done. And the career arc ends. But it seems so like roller coaster up, roller coaster down, job finished. Um, but I was looking at the gender pay gap curve in Denmark. This is the data that's often uh, cited because this talks about your, this is your career arc. But I was wondering who you was, because that's a really nice curve. Um, and so when you look at the gender pay gap curve, uh, research in Denmark, when you are, in this case, if you are having a child as a man, in this case, or a child as a woman in mm. Denmark, um, of course, you can have children of all different cases, but in this case, um, there's this gigantic like curve that falls. It's like that's like serious data there. That says that once a woman woman has a child, their pay gap occurs, and then they can never recover. Whereas mm. if you're over here, that's that's a nice that's a nice curve. It kind of looks like this curve. I couldn't I couldn't notice, but the curves <laughs> look similar. Um, any thoughts on this curve? By the way, I want to advertise you to advertise the the, the DMI. The thing, you're the board chair of the Design <laughs> Management Institute. That's a big deal, folks. <laughs> it's a summit this week. Yeah. Go, go, go. No, no, uh, thank you, John. So anyone curious about Design Management Institute, go to dmi.org. We're actually having uh, what, what's been a new series for us. Uh, we have this annual uh, diversity and inclusion in design conference. We virtualized it for this week, but it's happening this week. So go to dmi.org to check out uh, DMI's Diversity Manifesto and the speakers and panels that we have for this week and encourage you to register. Hmm. So what's your take on that graph? Just sort of like, what's is not <sighs> off the record? We're like on this live thing, so it's hard. And I, can't, I have no idea how to use LinkedIn Live. I can't like do stuff on it, but uh, what's your, when you saw that, what hit you? Uh, it, it's definitely uh, sobering. Um, while I def definitely empathize with uh, you know women with children and that disparity, right? It, my mind immediately scrambles to want to find all the different plots of all the different demographics, right? And I wonder, you know, initially about uh, black women being on the bottom end of every, you know, social economic, uh, you know, spectrum when it comes to their level of respect for their professional skills and how they navigate, right? And and you're dealing with a demographic that's, you know, one of the most educated to be able to do things with tons of potential. And then I think uh, I think about um, the, the black community uh, that I'm a proud member of, right? And it just, um, it makes me question the state of equity and justice, um, the wealth gap that we continue to see exacerbate, um, the level of representation not reflected in boards and C-level suites and, and, and leadership teams in general, um, professional lane STEM, STEAM fields. Um, and the level of inclusion in all of that is is actually appalling. I'll be quite honest, absolutely appalling. And what what what's on my mind the most, especially over the last couple of weeks, um, you know, with Ahmad Aubrey's tra tra tragedy in Georgia, uh, to what we saw with George recently, we've been all, we've all been jarred by these videos um, to the extreme. Right, I, I think a lot of this was happening a couple of years ago, but I mean, I think these, these, these were recently the, the videos that you were surprised by where it was like in your face, full vivid detail. And, and um, I definitely, you know, my, my prayers and sympathies to those families that, that are affected and our community is hurting in general. But I would say that black people have been speaking about these issues uh, from the very beginning. And it's just that um, now we see it thanks to the rise of social media. Um, and people, you know, non-black uh, demographics are now sort of waking up to the fact that, you know, they should have been listening to us all along. Um, so that's that's one. And I'm still, you know, I, I'm not at peace. I'm not okay, right? And I'm I'm still processing. And my family and my son, if my son opens social media or looks over my shoulder, I, I worry about if he's going to catch any of that media, right? And see see what happened and. We're, we're having slow conversations with him to help him understand what's going on. Um, so that, that's the one thing that I'm still processing, honestly, and then, uh, it's terrible. The, but the, the thing I, I would like to shine a light on is that 
if, if we think about white supremacy and, and, and these waves of systemic racism, there's a lot of things that actually happen that are sort of beneath the surface of what we see in these jarring media episodes, right? There's, there's um, microaggressions in the workplace, like areas where we spend a lot of time. So whether it's school, academia, uh, the workplace, there's um, a lot of stuff that's passively accepted under the guise of, you know, oh, it's just subconscious. It's Well, no, I think a lot of these things actually, actually are conscious because people might be afraid, they might be territorial, they might fear the unknown, they, they're just plain ignorant to what they, they don't understand and their worldview hasn't been exposed to the black experience. I think about that all the time. Um, but I, I would say your black employees inside organizations are not okay because these jarring moments make us think about all those other things that are happening systemically in our experience where we, we don't feel like we can be our full selves when we enter the workplace. I want to be my full self. And part of the motivation to start Green's Design and Life is wanted to be myself, wanted to bring the best suite of capabilities that I represent in the world, my voice, and use that to serve people, to use that to serve organizations. And I, I, I don't want any more inhibitors getting in the way of that, right? So that's, that's why that, that, that conviction drives some of the decisions that I've made. Um, I think I'm also a little jarred by some of the, the rhetoric that I see from enterprises on social media, like a lot of the you know brand campaigns and and things, and um, and I'm comparing that to like what I see internally in those organizations. I talk to a lot of people in creative, you know, roles. We we see what they're saying. You know, you can see it. The, the connectivity is there. The transparency is there thanks to social media, Twitter, you know, the like. You can see what people are saying, what's happening inside. I know my friends, my black friends, and the experiences that they're having, the gaslighting, the microaggressions, the, the lack of concrete feedback to help them in their careers, um, the, the, the games, the mind games that are played in terms of, yeah, we'll bring you in for the interview, we'll give you no sense of what success looks like, and then we'll berate you when you leave without telling you what, you know, what is going on or what the fit is or anything like that. So um, I, I just... Um, I would just implore organizations to understand that people are watching you and there's a lot of hard work that you got to do inside your walls. Um, it, it, it's not a flash in the pan diversity initiative one, one and done. We're talking about systemic transformation to unravel a lot of the supremacist and racist notions that are happening in a more subtle way in your organizations. And no organization is immune, right? We, we all have to fight bias. We all have to fight ignorance. Education is a big instrument here, but again, it's this is a multi-pronged approach that I, I think I really want people to, to take away from this, that, that the work is hard. Uh, at DMI, you know, we're going to reinforce again this week that you got to go find um, experts that are trained in this field, right? And I know the diversity and inclusion uh, arena is an industry in itself, as we talked about before, but you got to find experts that know how to tap in, how to look at the, the system in your platform. And you got to really partner together to make um, systemic change across the board. You got to make gutsy calls. You got to have tough conversations. It has to be a strategy with a lot of putting your money where the mouth is and really implementing a, a better way forward for your for your employees to m have your external message sort of match your inward promise. Wow. You know, Kevin, I feel fortunate to be your friend and a partner in this Mutual field people. of trying to figure out how technology, business, and design can intersect. And I realized that a lot of it is about this art creative piece, which is emotional. But as human beings, without the emotions, we're nothing, right? That's right. So... It's when people say or feel like, wow, there's something happening right now and not realizing that it's been happening for a very, very long time and you can hear it now and in a year from now, will you still hear it? Um, yeah, there, there is a danger, right? We, the apathy can set back in. We can get back to quote unquote normal after COVID, after the protests die down, after the election in November, whatever happens. You know, 
and we could we could lose our eye off the ball. Like we can't let that happen. And I think that's that's where my hope is that if everyone waking up, that we continue to fuel the momentum, we continue to change behaviors, we educate, we 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 go address local elections where there was so much apathy before, and and um, you know we empower uh, the the young generation with fresh ideas to help us find new ways forward. Hmm. I gotta say, well, we're, we're, it's it's twelve. It was that's the thirty minute mark. I like to be, sure. I like to be on time, but I want to <laughs> make sure we talk about your book a little bit. And so, if you, people who can stay five six minutes later, please stay on. Um, you know, you know, I began to design in tech reports at Kleiner Perkins, and then there were these uh, three junior folks who taught me, no, oh, John, talk, think about this. Like, this is how you should look at it. And this is how you should. I was like, oh, teach me, teach me, teach me. And so I just want to acknowledge the younger generation for the ability to articulate what someone like myself may have just forgotten or cared mm-hmm. about or became clear around. That's where I discovered that I'm a type O minority. As an Asian American man, I can go everywhere and I can advocate Mm -hmm. on behalf of everyone. Um, So I want to thank them for that. Because we're in the business world and Mm -hmm. the business world uh, has a responsibility and accountability to do good business for good people, for the good consumers. And you are penning a new book. Um, I know you're like... uh, the progress indicator is sort of like getting across um, about strategic innovation through design. And it's a lot about multidisciplinarity. Any sort of thought for people out there who want to tune into your signal of, of why they want to like pick up your book when it comes out and like, sure, go ahead. No, um, thank you for that. Um, honestly, I think multidisciplinary collaboration, I honestly believe it's the fuel that informs where future innovation is going to come from. But if we look at the situation uh, recently and even up to today, most organizations are not necessarily primed or oiled to spend enough bandwidth together as an interdisciplinary unit to really conceive of new concepts that could turn into new business opportunities. And so um, I think the the common rubric that is on everyone's mind in in the business world is notions of design thinking and human-centered design. And I think that's that's been incredibly powerful over the last um, you know, 10, 15 years. But I think the way um, with the trends that you've articulated in the 2020 CX report, congratulations on that, by the way, <laughs> the, 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 the forces that are at play, exponential forces, shifts in social behavior, shifts in value criteria, the transparency and connectivity, these forces are creating ripe environments for disruption, hopefully systematic change, and, and the need for multidisciplinary teams to come together will be more pressing more than ever. And what my book does as an extension and evolution from design thinking is to really um, help people understand how to be more deliberate about the ra- arrangement of their design and innovation capabilities uh, to really improve their, their relevance, the relevance to their audiences, but also improve their ability to see the future differently and allow that future foresight to better contextualize the things that are being built today. And, and you really you know, leveraging uncertainty as a, a powerful variable that it is, and that it's not something that you should be scared of and to re- always react to it, right? I think, I think this book will hopefully give individuals and organizations some license of how to play better for the future. Hmm. I'm gonna read a sentence that I'm sure is not authorized by your, your publisher. Um, <laughs> I, I strongly believe that <laughs> multidisciplinary team collaboration is the currency that will inform future innovation. If we're to look through a looking glass toward a distant time horizon, a multidisciplinary team can see the future through a number of different vantage points. You're talking about diversity and including different viewpoints and realizing it's, a, it's not a, a business aha. It's how great businesses were formed and need to form. Am I right? Absolutely right. I just Thank read you, your John. book. That's, that's how I knew that. So anyways, <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. It's 1235. I'm now going to press a button to see if this, the, 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 my fancy audio closing thing works. Thank you, Kevin, for doing this Thank with you, me, John. being the first pancake along with me. This was a little messy, but um, have a great day over there. Take care. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.